Welcome to our last and final official <laughs> monthly colloquium here at our Stigidi University. Wow. Yay! <laughs> it is a little sad. Uh, we're really, really pleased to have with us uh, Dr. Jaffe Rosenberg. He got his PhD from Duke University and worked there for five years as an assistant professor. And then he's been out in the, uh, in the business world, in industry, and uh, you were CTO at uh, that point? What, what's the name of the company that you were? Um, I, I was uh, CTO at Novasoft. We changed its name, oh, then it and I became CEO of FactPoint. CTO at Nova Point. Novasoft, Novasoft, yeah. Novasoft. They're all the CTO same. CTO at FactPoint, and now co-founder of uh, GeoTrust. And uh, Dr. Rosenberg is going to kind of give us the perspective, which is in between a lot of the perspective we've had this whole year. We've had some very, very technical talks, and we've had some very, very uh, VC money kind of talks. And this is the the talk right in between about what really happens with uh, with startup companies from the engineer's point of view. And this is something that some of you may really be able to use in the next five or 10 years yourselves, I hope. So please welcome Dr. Jaffe. Yeah, I thought I'd, um, um, I think I can really speak from your perspective or or where you will be coming from. Um, and um, because I've, I've been an engineer for, I could still consider myself an engineer, but um, sort of an entrepreneur uh, also on the side. So um, basically what my, my talk is just a series of questions, which I will then try to answer. And you may have more questions or, or you may have more answers, but we'll, uh, we'll at least uh, try that. And I'm going to sit down. Um, it's, uh, it's easier for me to sit down than to stand up and walk around. Um, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about my, myself, a little more than you already just heard. Um, I, um, I'm, I'm older than you. I got my Ph.D. in 1983, and um, I, at that time I was doing my Ph.D. in VLSI computer-aided design. Uh, we were, this was at Duke, and Duke at the time was, was part of a five-university consortium building a, their own fabrication uh, facility. This was back in the days when uh, Berkeley and uh, MIT and Stanford and a few other schools, uh, Duke included, were using facilities of the uh, uh, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, and we were all trying to build smaller and smaller chips. And then North Carolina decided that uh, to, uh, they were going to compete with Boston and Silicon Valley and really try to create a little mecca uh, Silicon Piedmont or something ridiculous like that. And we built a one micron fab facility, which in 1985, 86, when it came online, was pretty darn good. Um, and then when I switched over to being a professor, um, we, we started to use what we just developed, and we were building massively parallel super, supercomputers with this fab facility. So we were trying to build... Uh, thousand processor single board computers that would be uh, hardened enough to be space flyable and go up on the space shuttle. And um, so we were, the, the architecture we were using was SIMD, single instruction multiple data computers. So every processor is fairly simple but has different data store. Every processor does the exact same instruction in lockstep. Um, but you can do amazing things if you have data parallel algorithms like Fast Fourier transform, for example, is perfect, or uh, seismic data reduction, or even unstructured text searching. It's fabulous at that. But don't try to get it to, you know, compute some algorithm that, uh, you know, just doesn't belong in a data parallel kind of environment. Um, th that got exciting enough to me that I decided that, that trying to build such a such a system in a university setting wasn't working. I had no continuity. A grad student would say. Great, thanks for the masters. Poof, gone, and nobody was there to maintain this, the code, and it was getting more and more difficult. So I joined a startup company, and I've been doing that kind of thing, startup companies, ever since. First one was uh, Masspar in Sunnyvale, California, and then um, I was intrigued enough, and I'd written, by this time I'd written about 50,000 lines of C++ code, 
um, which was an interesting thing because I'd been teaching it f first, then I wrote 50,000 lines of code in it, and I realized that now I really knew how to teach it because I don't think you can teach C++ until you've done that. So it was really beginning to reinforce my decision to go out and do this for a while. I'll go back and teach in a few more years. Um, i got to do a few more of those 50,000 line things. But, um, but in four years, we only built 100 supercomputers, so we didn't have that many customers. And I was really intrigued with the exact opposite extreme. What was it like to build something where within a month you had 30,000 new customers? So even though it was going to the dark side, because I had been a Unix person my entire career, I decided to join Borland. I knew I was going to have to get a PC, actually put Microsoft software on my desktop. I was willing to suck it up and deal with it to learn how to write software of that caliber. How many of you have ever used any Borland tools? It's getting to be a little dated by now. But, you know, a few years ago, if I asked this question, everybody in the room would raise their hands. It was, that, that was, that was the tool set to use. They were always really high quality. I was there in their heyday, and I was responsible, even though I guess I spelled it wrong, I was responsible for Delphi, <laughs> C++, and, and Java. And we ship, shipped uh, seven shrink wrap products in a total of five years brought a lot of money into the company, and had a lot of customers. This was the kind of thing, though, that where the pride you have, and I know all of you have felt this when you've built something and you want to show it off. I would go to the store. We had a store in, in that area called Fry's. I'd go there, and I would sort of hide down the aisle, and I'd watch somebody <laughs> pick up the box and, and, and look at it, and then if they put it down and picked up Microsoft, I'd throw something at them. <laughs> but if they, if, if they did pick it up and go to the checkout counter, I'd follow them, and I would watch them actually pay for it because that was just, that was it. That was, you that was, them all the way <laughs> in case they had a question, I was, I was built in tech support. Were, were these compilers or the developed IDEs? Yeah, it was, yes, was the answer. It was, okay. it was both. I mean, initially it was everything. We, sometimes we would, we would sh ship a separate uh, set of tools from the IDE, but we got to the point where we were just shipping the whole thing. Um, and at one point, this was before we could really switch to CDs, um, it, would, it would shipped on 35 floppies. Um, Bor Borland had me move out here because we, were, we acquired a company in Cambridge, and they asked me to come out and run it. Um, I'm a native Californian, so that was, this was a big, big change for me. And you can imagine that you know, I, pro I thought I wouldn't like it. Well, we were here for about four months. And we couldn't believe we hadn't moved sooner. We were thrilled. We loved it. And we've been here ever since. That's five years ago. Uh, <laughs> well, I, li I like the winter. I like the, I like the change of seasons. So, so far, so good. Um, anyway. The timeline when you were at Borland was? Was 92 to 97. And then um, out here, uh, a bunch of us decided to leave Borland because we were over out here and the mothership was starting to go down. And so we, uh, not of its own accord, it's the Microsoft story, but some other time. Um, and the, um, we, we went off and formed a little company called Webspective. So five of us formed this little company. Actually, at the time, it was called Net Propulsion. But we got into the same kind of trouble that a lot of entrepreneurs get into. They forgot to check to see if the name was taken. We checked in California, Massachusetts, but we forgot to check in Wisconsin. And you have to have the name everywhere. Uh, of course, nowadays you check first to see if you can get the domain name. Um, and that sold to Inc. to me in 99. Uh, and then I joined a company called uh, Novasoft initially as CTO. And we changed this name, um, hoping that would fool people, and changed our business model completely. And I'm going to get into a little bit about that in a, in a little while. And, um, but but uh, Factpoint's an important story f for everybody because um, if you're at a company that's in a, in a market that's declining and you're not first in the market anyway, it's really bad. Okay, so Novasoft was in the document management business and was third in that space, but the whole space was declining. So even the leader's revenues were, share were shrinking. Um, so... Um, that's okay, maybe, if you're a public company and you can, you know, you can maybe survive, although a lot of people aren't. But if you're, if you're a venture-backed company, 
they want their money. And so um, they asked me to try to do a turnaround on this. And being naive and thinking that I was hot shit, I thought I could do that. Um, and we came close, but we didn't quite pull it off. And then ultimately the venture capitalists say, where's my money? Um, if, you, if I can't get, see a return on my money, we're shutting it down. And nowadays you're hearing about lots of shutdowns. The, when we ended up shutting down Factpoint, um, it was it was 99. It was not that common, and it was pretty harsh, pretty painful. Um, and so, but I was able to convince them that look, it's all gone. You're shutting it down, and so they sold me source code, um, uh, all the patents, cubes, laptops, and printers. For sixty-five thousand dollars, I was able to start a new company that's now doing extremely well. You looted the place. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, these are the big topics I'm going to cover. Just a little bit about startups, and um, the most important thing you can ever do is, if you're going to join a startup, um, evaluate them really carefully to see if this is where you should go. And we're going to talk a little bit about that and how you should do it. And I'm not going to give you the same perspective as the VCs because they will lie. Um, I mean, you got to understand what motivates people. So what motivates them is, you know, if you come there and you're good and they're struggling, that, that you may help them and therefore you help him. And he doesn't care about you, really. Okay? They only care about their money. And, you know, I'll say that to their faces. They, they will admit that's true. And we'll talk about venture capital and venture capitalists and a little bit about equity, because you do want to also look out for yourself. Um, and we're not going to talk about getting rich, because that's not what I think is important. It's one of the reasons why I'm glad I don't live in California anymore. One of the things that happened there, and I hope it doesn't happen here, is that when I first was in this, in this field, and had left Duke and gone back to California, when you talk to people, they would say, boy, what I'm working on is really innovative. We're going to we're just going to, we're doing things that nobody else has done before. We're solving really hard problems. And then about 10 years later, when you went and asked people, they would say, my company's worth $2 billion. I'm worth a million. I'm going to flip this one and go to the next one, and I'm probably going to only stay there six months and go to the one after that. That sucks. And I still don't see that happening here. And I'm very thankful, actually, for the, the crash. I know that's hard to, harsh to hear, but... It's, uh, it's actually sobering people up a little bit. Okay. Um, so, I mean, maybe some of the questions here are obvious. Oh, I see that that line's still there, so everybody's getting sick. I wondered why you guys were all looking, you know, like you were going to throw up. <laughs> um, um, so, everybody knows what startup is. Um, and a lot of people call things startups that aren't, you know, aren't, very young anymore. It doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the age of the company. It more or less really has to do with um, the size of the company and the the feel of it. And that's what you know. People say, does this feel like a startup? Well, for example, this place feels like a startup. Okay, and that's a compliment. And for me, that's a compliment. That's a good thing. Um, I think if you walk into a company and you are, your, your mindset is, I want to go work at a startup, and, and we'll talk about why you might want to, um, then you should expect a certain kind of feel. It, it, it should be very informal. It should be, you should not see any um, waste. You shouldn't see them spending money on things that don't make sense, that don't directly contribute to building something for customers that's valuable, that, that they will make money on, or else they won't be around very long. Um, and the, it used to be that, that they got started by, uh, you know, you had some family money and you could get a little group of people started and then you could figure out how to, you know, generate money from customers and you would keep going. Th that used to be how it was done. And, and then there were a few venture capitalists. You guys may not realize this, but how many of you ever even heard of Eastern Airlines? Sure. Okay. Eastern Airlines was started by a venture capital firm uh, from New York called Venrock. That's the Rockefeller family's money. Um, that was in 1935. So venture capital has been around for a long time. Um, it's just it, it's only in the last 10 to 15 years that it's become 
sort of this engine for creating companies. Before that, it was a pretty rare kind of thing. Um, so besides, you know, family members that start them, uh, companies themselves start them. They'll create a little spin-off. So um, uh, Fairchild, you know, out in Silicon Valley, the reason that that became the kind of place it is is that Fairchild pretty much started it all, and uh, Stanford made it easy. Stanford created uh, a mechanism where, unlike any other university, they gave them some property to build on in return for equity. They would give them some facil other kinds of facilities. They would help them in a lot of different ways, and they would get equity for it. So they got equity in Intel. They got equity in a lot of these companies out there. So um, a lot of times it was from spinoffs. And, um, and once they get started, um, any company, there's no, you know, these are not altruistic companies. These are not nonprofits. They're not making a profit, but they're not designed to be nonprofits, many of them. And the idea is they have to figure out fairly quickly, and, and now that the, the dust has settled from all this craziness, it's back to that. They've got to figure out how to make money themselves. And, um, and that's the only way they can survive. The, the venture capitalists have some rules on their funds. They get their funds from someone else usually as well. I mean, yeah, they can generate some from their investments, but most of them are funded from big pension funds, big uh, university endowments, things like that. So they're, those are called limited partners, and then the managing partners are the, the, the guys that you think of as the VCs that go around making the deals. So they have people to answer to, and those funds are created. So you'll hear about, you know, Olympic Venture Partners 1. That's a fund. It has a finite size. They've got a set of investors, and they have to make a return on that investment within a certain period of time. And then that fund closes down, and then they start a new fund. So you don't have an infinite amount of time to make a startup successful. And we're going to talk about exit strategies in a minute that comes back to that issue. One of the first things, the word business model, what does it mean? Um, it, it, it means it's a description of, of how the products um, go into the market, how they're sold, um, how you're paid. So, for example, um, advertising on the web where you get paid by every eyeball that sees it, you know, that's a description of a business model, not a particularly good one anymore in people's minds. Um, the model of, okay, I, I sell software in a store. Uh, I have to pay the, the, the store for it. I have to pay the distributor for it. But ultimately, the customer buys it for $100, and, and I end up seeing uh, 50 of that. Okay, that's a business model for shrink wrap software. And there are an infinite number of these. And depending upon your market, um, there, you know, there, are, um, there, there are a lot of, of variables that you can play with. And just as you can be very creative in your software, you can be very creative in your business model. And that's one of the things that if you're going into a company, you want to understand the business model. How does it compare to everybody else's? Is it just another one of the same? Then what's the angle? It could be the same, in which case, well, it's a much better product. It's much cheaper to make. It saves the you know, customer more money uh, so that they're motivated to buy it from you. You need to really understand the business model. Don't, don't just evaluate a company based on the writing cool software. I mean, I, obviously, you want to write cool software, but you want to make sure you're doing it in a place where you're going to get to keep doing it because they have a good business model. You understand it. They ought to be able to articulate it, articulate it to you, and, and, and you're going to be able to compare that to what else you see and make a, a, an informed decision. This makes sense to me. This looks like it will make money, or it already is making money, and it looks like it's competitive. The, the other thing you're going to want to do, and sometimes this is tricky, is to really evaluate the management team. If you think about the way the V, because you're doing something actually similar to the VC. The VC is saying, I'm going to invest in this company because they've got a great idea, a great business model, a great team that can deliver it. And you want to do the exact same thing. 
Obviously, you're going to get a chance to meet the team you'll be working with, but you're going to want to meet the management team as much as you can. And, and if, if you can't meet them, you're going to want to at least find out who they are and do some research on, on them. What have they done? What do other people say about them? Ask around. See if you can get any kind of, of uh, sort of blind reference check on them. Um, one of my pet peeves is companies that have great long-term vision, and we all get excited about those. You know, there's going to be, we're, we're going to have uh, really intelligent shoes that can tell when we walk in the store, and the store is going to be able to know everything about us. And so, and all the all the milk bottles are going to have the ink dots, the ink dot codes on them, so we can just fill up our basket and walk out, and everything's going to be charged to us. And our refrigerator is going to know when it goes in the refrigerator. This is cool stuff, but Okay, now how are you going to make money tomorrow? On the other hand, if all they have is some flash-in-the-pan short-term thing, unless that's what you want to do and you want to see a company that's going to, its only mission in life is to get bought by somebody else, and that can be traumatic, um, then you don't want a company that only has a short-term vision and you don't want a company that only has a long-term vision. And... What I look for, or what I recommend VCs that ask me my opinion look, should look for, is both. Good management team, actually three things. Good management team, great long-term vision with a business model that makes sense, and a way to make money quick so that they can bootstrap themselves and deliver on the long-term vision. And then the last thing is, what, what is there that differentiates them from competition? And if the answer is there is no competition, you should probably run as fast as you can from from the building because um, there needs to be competition. It, it's what defines you. It's what defines a market. If you go to a company that says, that's okay, there is no market yet, we're inventing a market, little companies don't invent new markets. Little companies take little slices out of existing markets, turn them upside down, change them, do all kinds of cool things, and when they get bigger, they can invent new markets, but little companies don't invent new markets. Um, and you have to, so what's the competition and what is your long-term sustainable competitive advantage? That could be the business model. It could be the, the technology, combination of both. But what is it? Can they articulate it? Do you understand it? Do you believe it? Can you see yourself being part of making that even more so? Can a small company be the first to respond to a new market? Or do you think new markets are created explicitly? They don't just bubble up and then whoever notices them first and jumps jumps on it have a competitive advantage? Or? Well, take let's take Palm, for example. Okay, So Palm was a little company, and they absolutely broke that market wide open with the, with the, pi, with the pilot. But that market had existed. It We weren't impressed with it, the Newton... Casio, the this and that and the other thing, they came along and they figured they they figured it out and they wired it just right and they and they and they got it out there. But they still had competition. They still had competition. Was a very good right, right, and uh, and I think that's always true. I mean, my little company right now, we're doing something. There is one thing we're doing, one product we're selling for which there is no direct competitor. But I would never say that the company itself is in a market that it's created. We're in, you know, the security space, and we're doing something a little bit different in that space. But our competition is absolutely, you know, VeriSign, Entrust, Baltimore, those guys. But, you know, then you kind of drill down with a microscope and you say, well, wait a minute, product by product, what does it look like? And then it starts to be, well, yeah, maybe you're doing something that doesn't have direct competition, but as a company, it does. Please do just fire questions away and. Uh, in this software, I mean, suppose somebody creates a, an innovative piece of software that immediately catches fire and gets used ubiquitously. I mean, obviously, you're going to have other software coming up competitively. But that, I mean, it clearly places that software ahead of, of everyone else, at least for the short term. Yeah, um, there are examples, and there are examples of actually where what I said isn't true. I mean, uh, I was about to say VisiCalc, actually, the, the spreadsheet. You know, they really they invented something. But 
but when you really want to think about it, who were they competing against? They were competing against people on using pieces of paper. Uh, I mean, there's never something that's that's just got no. And and one of the things you want to do is actually sometimes you don't want to pick your you know you want to declare your competitor be something that is not maybe not so obvious like the piece of paper approach. That's that's a very reasonable thing to do, but it defines you, sure. and it positions you. Um, so sources of capital. There's a few people that s self fund, and um, uh, there are fewer now, I guess, than there were a year ago. But but there's still still people that that can do that. Um, rich friends, family, uh, angels are a specific kind of investor that. Uh, they typically only do the very, very early stage. They typically only do a, what we would consider to be a relatively small amount of money, 100000 maybe. So if you've got you, know, you and, and two buddies, you can find these people, pitch them your idea. The, the only downside to them is that they won't, they're not the kind of people that will stay with you. And the, the, the venture capitalists, they're, they're always going to, their, their plan, anyway, is to give you money at, at, at the round A financing and then give you some at round B and round C. We'll talk about that more. But angels, typically, it's a one-shot deal. They want to get a, a particular amount of ownership in the company, and then you're on your own to find other sources of financing. But they're a good thing to know about, and you can find out about them on the web. I'm sure if you type in angels, you'll find a lot of interesting things that are not this, but... Um, you can get funding from banks, but not for high-risk kinds of things, which it's hard to imagine anybody in this room doing something where you could go just get a loan from a bank to, to start a company. They're just, they're not prepared for it. They're not, their risk profile is all wrong for them to do that. Are there banks that started venture funds? Yes. Yes. And then they've got, and then they have the characteristic of a venture fund. So one of my investors is Bank America Ventures. Another one is St. Paul Ventures, which is a huge insurance company, and you know their risk profile is, is, is low. But they carve out and they say, here, here's a billion dollars over in this venture capital fund. Um, you know, just give us reports about how much is coming back to us from the, you know, the turnover, but otherwise um, hire professional people who are venture capital type people. And they, so, yeah, there's a little risk profile difference right there in that, that group. But they're venture capitalists. Uh, venture capitalists are a mixture of people. They typically have, um, a lot of them have business degrees. So um, one of the things that you're going to want to also do, by the way, is, is evaluate your venture capitalists if you go out looking for money. Um, if, if, if you're working with somebody who's fresh out of Harvard or MIT business school, um, that's okay, but you probably want to also make sure you find some VCs with some real experience. Um, and there's an increasing number of them that have operational experience, ex-entrepreneurs. You know, an entrepreneur, like I know the guy that started PowerSoft and then was it, and then started Silverstream is now a VC. Uh, the, the guy that started Spyglass is now a VC. You'll see a lot of that. And th those guys have been there, done that. They understand what it means to have a very, very loyal group of people and have to do, you know, a reduction uh, and, and cut and let some people go within the company. Whereas you talk to somebody who's just out of business school and it's all a numbers game. I'm being a little harsh, but it's, it's, it's mostly true. A lot of the bigger companies, especially a year ago, had venture funds. I mean, even, even Goodyear, for, you know, you wouldn't expect it, but Goodyear had a venture fund a year ago. I think they've probably done away with that by now. But Fidelity Ventures is a very active venture fund. Um, Intel Ventures, extremely active. Cisco, a lot of these, these guys have venture funds. What they typically do, however, is they first want there to be a strategic relationship between the parent company, like Intel, and this little company, and then the venture group will get in, in, involved. So typically you have to first go and pitch your idea to the line of business guys who say, yes, this is important. I'm going to buy this product or service. It, it's going to help me 
reduce my costs or whatever, and, and then they'll introduce you to the venture group. So we got funded by Fidelity Ventures at Webspective because we dramatically improved their website, and so that, that happened first, and then Fidelity invested in us. Um, they will typically... They have different phases. They're going through a phase where they're looking for new companies. There's a phase where they're uh, really working to grow their portfolio, and they're looking to promote exit strategies with their more mature companies. And, and a typical VC will have um, eight to ten companies that that individual is working on. And as one goes to an IPO or just as, you know, in the latter stages, they'll be looking at, five or ten to evaluate to bring a new one on at the other end of the pipeline. Um, and they're, they're always, their challenge is evaluating companies. It's, it's, a tough, it's a tough thing to do. You got a business plan, you got a couple of guys, um, and if you're an early stage investor, if you're a later stage investor, you've got a working company, you're looking at how they've done, you're looking at what their plans are. Um, and they typically go outside and get advice from people. Um, that, that happens to me a lot. I, I think it happens. They, they probably call university professors a lot. I don't know if, if that if your experience is that you get called by VCs very much. No. no? <laughs> um, because they've got eight or ten companies that they're working on. They, if you, if you divide up their life, they can spend about two hours a month per company. And, and that's a really important number to keep in mind. You can spend about that's two. A lot of time on the golf course. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at, at, that's, you know, their, their board meetings, they got, they got ten board meetings a month, uh, or a quarter, you know, probably. They're, it depends. Early stage companies will have a board meeting every other month. And the board meetings for small companies tend to be about four hours long. So they've got that. They've got uh, evaluating new companies. They've got uh, dealing with uh, the, the financing. Financing, if they're in a company that's, that's involved with the financing, so for this blast of time, they're probably spending two hours a day. And then, so they don't have, that, they don't have time for anybody else. So it, it ends up being on an ongoing basis, you can count on about two hours a month from your VC. When you're just in steady state, that two hours a month is your four hour every month, every other month board meeting. And that is literally how often you get a chance to interact with your. So they're spending more time than that on your project, presumably. They probably project. offload that to one of their assistants who's doing some, some work on it, but not a lot. I mean, there's, they're, they really, they swoop back in at the time of board meeting. They. They, they read, digest all your information. They, they catch up on what's happened in the last two months. They give you their opinion, their assessment. If there are problems, they're going to spend a little more time. But if everything's going pretty well, they're done. They're checked out. They tend to spend all their time on problems. What's an average timeline from the time the VCs get involved to the time the company either goes under or goes IPO or gets bought out by some other company, so it's some kind of conclusion? Um, I would say that uh, on average it's probably two years to one or the other uh, happens. So, so what's a good batting average, not money return wise, but just percentage wise, um, I've got eight companies, two years have gone by, so many made it, so many didn't. What's, what's the VC's good batting average? A really good VC, you know, Class A VC, probably six of the eight are, are alive and two are gone. Um, alive meaning that they've either gone IPO, been bought by another company, or they're just still percolating along. Two means that they sold them at a loss, two, two gone, sold them at a loss, shut them down, uh, and that I'm not that number is not focused on difficult times like right now. That that's averaged over a longer period of time. So good times and bad. And, and what's a good amount of return on their invested money over that same period total over the? They have to see in order for the numbers to work out for them. They have to aim for 10 to 1 return on investment. Mm -hmm. um, and they're usually pretty happy with five to one, anything less than five to one, and they actually 
are you know in some trouble because of because those two that went down, you know they're not yet making money on the other. So there's there was eight, two are gone. Um, of the six that's left, four are they're not making any money on, and and two maybe they sold. So there's still the, the jury's still out on on some of these. So with that many that fail, and sometimes the failures are expensive. You know. No, no, this is even before the crazy stock market time. I mean, this, this says that um, you, uh, you, put in, you put in $5 million. You, um, the next round of financing a year later, you expect that the, the company's valuation probably tripled or maybe quadrupled. You put in another $5 million, maybe a little bit more, you expect a year later for it to have doubled again in value and be bought or so, or, or an IPO, and that's before the craziness. And and so, you know, you're, you're getting up there to the point where you can start to see, you know, 10x your, your money. So that means by the end of that first year, in order for that tripling expectation to happen to give them the second round, they have to already be making a substantial... Profit. No, not or a profit. Is there a valuation that's tripled? The valuation is what's tripled. Not so they they probably are not in one year. You're probably not right. making a profit, okay. but you're probably hopefully you're making some revenue, and that you can convince people that you really will make revenue. That your value is three times. Mm -hmm. Well, your value comes from it's what it's does that come from? well it's similar to the valuation is done in a very similar way to your house is valued. Okay. Similar companies, it's on comps. It's similar companies, and they'll look for a whole series of fundable events. So, um, and fundable events, this is a really good question, because fundable events are things that everyone in the company can be thinking about. If, like today, we're on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. So that's a fundable event for GeoTrust. We were mentioned only because most of the company's working tomorrow, and they decided that that was... <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The fundable event is is you know getting that kind of name recognition. We're getting calls in the office this afternoon from all kinds of people. Some of them are bottom feeders, but but some of them are, are legitimate calls. Um, another fundable event is you sign a deal with a Fortune 500 company who commits to buying a certain amount of stuff from you. Absolutely fundable event. Right then you can just watch your valuation go up. Um, valuation comes from. Some bunch of experts somewhere crunching numbers. It's actually not. I wouldn't call it experts for crunching. <laughs> I would. It's, throwing darts. At you. Well, it's it, like I said. It's like your house. So what's to say that my house and the house four blocks away really are the same? Yeah, they've got the same number of bedrooms, but theirs is theirs is brown wood and mine's brick white. I mean. But they've decided that they're comparable, and it's a subjective kind of thing. Isn't it, isn't it really simply the, whatever someone's prepared to pay? Well, maximize that. Yes, yeah. but I mean, the people who are—it's—it's it's, since you're not a public company, so it's not the marketplace doing it; it's the private market. In other words, it's the investors who are coming in and and ready to plunk down money. And it's a game you play because if you if you as a management team price it too high, they're going to say, "Forget it. I won't get enough return on my money." If you price it too low, you know they they might come in, but then you know your your valuation is lower, which affects you know you and everyone in the company. And as the as the management of the company, what you're trying to do is maximize everyone, all shareholders' value, and all of your employees are shareholders. So we'll, and we'll get to that. So um, okay, how do they make money? They only make money. When there's some sort of an exit event, and we'll talk about what that means in in a second. I have a whole thing on exit. So um, what the what the venture guys get is equity or stock, and they get what's called preferred stock. Um, what when it finally gets sold into the public marketplace. What's being sold is common stock. So preferred stock is it's what you would expect. It means that they get some sort of preferential treatment because of owning this stock. And typically what that means is that 
they get to sell it first, or they may be able to sell it at a slightly premium price. It, it can mean a number of those kinds of things. It, it could be, um, I mean, for example, if it's sold to another company, preferred stock gets a liquidation preference, which means if, you, if the company is sold for $500 million, they get their money first, then it goes to the next level and the next level and the next level. So even if it's not convertible, it's, it's still their, their preferred. So, so they, they're getting real stock, though as opposed to options, right? They've got real stock, they own it, pieces of paper printed. Now they can't go sell it on the open market because it's not a publicly traded stock yet. Okay, options are what we typically give to employees. And these were invented as a way to incent people to stay and keep working hard. And that is that you have an option to buy stock at some time in the future and the amount that you get to buy is going to increase the longer you're there. So there's an incentive to stay. That's called vesting. And if you stay, you know, typically four years, your initial grant of options is all yours to buy. You now have the option to buy it. You don't own it at all. You weren't really given anything except the privilege. Or a price. And a price. Right. And a price, which I'm going to get to in a second. So um, when you were given them the options, and this is one of the real benefits of them, you were given them at some price, which is called a strike price, and that is the price that you will pay for them when you decide to exercise them. And exercising them is converting them into real stock. And it will virtually always be common stock. Um, you can't do that until it's publicly... No, you can. You can you can exercise your options whenever you have that, you know, the vesting has happened, you can convert them. And the company has agreed, no matter what, in writing they've agreed, you may pay the strike price any time over the life of the option grant, which is typically 10 years. So from the time that you were granted it. So you, you go along and you say, okay, I'm going to exercise all the options that are now available to me. So you pay the strike price. Now, you own the certificate. You can't do anything with it unless you can convince some sucker to buy it from you on the private market until it goes public, and then you can sell it. Or if you're bought by another company, they will basically, if they're buying you for stock, they will convert your stock into theirs at some multiple. Would the strike price quite often be different for different wedges of stock for the same employee? Well, typically that's based on time. So at, at, you know, at this point in time, all, all options, and probably for the next you know, six months, all options that we grant will be at one price. There will be some sort of a fundable event that will occur that will change the strike price. And then there will be a, a new price. Hopefully it will keep going up. And then it goes up for everybody. If a company is bought, put it privately bought, do you, are your options, do you have any right to the options? It's right? not built in. There's, no, there's nothing that says that they have to be. Normally, uh, you, would. Normally you would because, when, especially when you're buying a software company, right. your asset is the people. So you're going to do things that encourage people to stay. Uh, you, typically what they'll do is they'll not only convert your options, keep your vesting schedule, they might actually accelerate your vesting schedule and grant you new options just to make you even more happy. Um, if, you're, if you're buying uh, a company and all you want is their assets and you don't want their people, you won't do any, you, you will find so many people who have been bought and then they made, they made nothing. They worked hard and they made nothing. And it's just the unfortunate fact of it's why you want to really evaluate these companies carefully what do they have? Uh, Computer Associates is a great example of a company that you don't ever want to be bought by because none of those employees have gotten a good deal. And it may finally be catching up to Computer Associates, but for years and years and years, they got away with it. They would, they would basically clean out the company. They, they wouldn't care at all. They wouldn't give the employees any options, and employees would leave, and they seemed not to care. 
options in a publicly traded company and the stock splits, does that affect your strike price at all? Yes. It matches what it cuts happened. cuts it in half. Yes. So you have twice the options at half the price. Um, Okay, one last thing. So we've talked about vesting. We've talked about strike price. We've talked about exercising. One last thing. I'm not a person to talk about taxes very much because I don't know much about them. But I, I will tell you, things that really burn me badly, I will tell you about. <laughs> and if you, if you don't exercise, let's say you were granted um, a 1,000 options and you vested in, in them, but you just sit on it. You, you've got your strike price of 50 cents still locked in for a long, long time, and you don't need to exercise them. But if you exercise them and then sell them, because the company's gone public now, you pay taxes on that like it's income at your same income rate. If you exercise your options, hold them for a year, and then sell them, you pay at the capital gains rate of 20%. So... Just remember that for the future, someday. <laughs> that will matter to you. Yeah, but nobody gives the kind, almost nobody gives the kind anymore that um, are exempt from this. There's two kinds, I, ISOs, incentive stock options, and NQs, non-qualifying. And you, you will be hard-pressed to find anyone giving NQs anymore uh, because they're disadvantageous to the company. And if you ask me to give you a long explanation of why I couldn't, but they are not good for the company. So what are the two, op so what are the two uh, places where you take your ISO and, and presumably sell it and make money? Just review the difference. Okay. Well, typically what the companies will do is they'll give you an option to do a same-day sale. Um, and it's a good deal if you don't have the resources to exercise your options and hold them for a year. If you want to... Buy your thousand shares, but they're, you know, they're a buck a piece, so that's a thousand bucks. But they're now on the market for thirty bucks a piece, so you're going to sell them for thirty thousand. Where are you going to come up with a thousand bucks? Well, the company will loan it to you for the five minutes that it takes to do the transaction, and then sell them. They'll subtract the thousand dollars out of the thirty thousand that was the sale price. Uh, at the same time, they'll go ahead and withhold all your taxes because it's the same as income now and give you the rest. The other way to do it is to write the company a check, and they'll give you back stock certificates for the amount, put them in the safe deposit box, whatever you want to do with them, hold them for a year, and sell them on the open market a year later. So the first way, it's as if you did not do an actual capital gains transaction from the point of view of the IRS. If That's it's right. It's as if it's income. yes, it's the same as income. It's as if you never exercised the option in some way. Well, well but you did because your number of options no, decreased. Right, but right, right. that's right. It's just straight right. ordinary income. Yes, it's not factored into your income. This new no, it's separate from your company keeps paying you your standard salary.